So far, we have seen the principle of inter interference, we have seen the principles of optical holography, we have seen the principles of digital holography, and now I'm going to show you how to use this, all of these principles in order to create digital uh, holograms for microscopy uses. So let us first talk about holographic phase microscopy for biomedical applications. Most living specimens in vitro or living biological cells are nearly transparent to light in the optical wavelengths, which actually means that we, if we image their intensity, their phase shifts are lost. And therefore we just see the edges of the cells. We cannot see things inside the cells, at least not in a quantitative way. Holography is able to capture the quantitative distribution of the optical pass delays or the optical thickness created by the sample. The main advantages of phase imaging biology is that we can reshape the complex wavefront if needed instead of using complex optical setups, which actually means that a single image is needed for a construction of the entire 3D scene. This is not completely true. We have X, Y, and optical thickness, but till a certain point, we can actually propagate into different Zs inside the 3D scene, and we have high sensitivity quantitative phase measurements which actually means that we have sub-wavelength axial accuracy and in contradiction with regular phase imaging such as differential interference contrast microscopy DIC or phase contrast microscopy this method is quantitative meaning that we can see for each point on the sample the phase information or the optical thickness of the sample. To record cells using this method we can use, for example, the Max Zender setup. We have two beam splitters. One, one beam passes through the sample, magnified by this MO, this microscope objective, and projected onto the camera using a 4F system using lens L2. Another beam comes directly from the source and goes through this another microscope objective, compensating objective, and interfere with the first beam on the digital camera plane. This is how it might look at the lab. So we have here the interferometric system, the Max Zender. We can see here two beam splitters, two mirrors. The sample sits right there. And right below the sample, you can see the microscope objective. And then we have another microscope objective. And this imaging system projects the image onto the camera. Behind the system, we have several lasers that are feeding the system. We need lasers which are coherent enough or at least have low coherence, for which it is harder to create interference, but there is less noise, less speckle noise. And when I'm using interferometric phase microscopy, in order to capture the entire wavefront, I can reshape the wavefront, and I can compensate for optical aberration, I can do semi-axial scanning as we have seen, and I have excellent contrast between the entire cell and its surrounding, and this is very important, because usually when I'm imaging transparent cells, I have to inject the sample external contrast agents, such as fluorescent dyes. I have to stain the sample, and this contrast agent might be toxic to the sample, and here I don't need to inject anything. I'm just taking the sample and putting that under an in, in, in interferometric microscope, and I'm using an internal feature of the sample, its phase, because I can capture the phase, I can capture the optical thickness. So the phase here is 2 pi over lambda, lambda is the illumination wavelength, this is a constant, multiplied by the optical thickness of the sample and the differences between the cell index of refraction, which is dependent in X, Y, but also in Z, and the index of refraction of the medium, which is very close to index of refraction of water, 1.33, because cells are usually being put inside of growth medium with an index of refraction which is close to water. This size, the multiplication between the refractive index of the 
third minus the refractive index of the uh, medium multiplied by the physical thickness of the sample is called OPD, optical pad delay. This is a profile. It is dependent on X and Y. And the other meaning is the optical thickness of the sample and it is equal again to the physical thickness of the sample per each point on the sample and the integral refractive index differences. The accuracy of the measurement that can be obtained for the OPD, the optical pad delay or the optical thickness of the sample is amazing. It is sub nanometer if I'm taking this OPD and sample it in time. That means that I'm very, very sensitive to very small optical thickness changes in the sample and I can, for example, trace how cells change their index of refraction or their physical thickness. As an example, you can see here white field interferometric frame microscopy, IPM, for live cell imaging. You can see here that using one off-axis holograms, I can process it into the phase profile of the sample, as you can see here, without using any contrast agents. I can see the red blood cells in these examples without using any external labeling and still get excellent contrast between the entire cell and its surrounding. Furthermore, I can use each cell in the field of view in order to reconstruct its physical thickness. For red blood cell, this is even simpler because I'm not recording only the optical thickness, I'm recording the physical thickness because for red blood cells that doesn't, that do not have a nucleus, I can actually assume a certain index of, index of refraction per the entire cell. So the phase information which is recorded, the phase profile is actually proportional to the physical thickness of the cell. So okay, I, I can actually get a 3D image. It's not real 3D, it's not X, Y, and Z. It's X, Y, and physical thickness in this case, and optical thickness if the cell has different organelles with different refractive index. Okay, so in this movie, you can see that using this technique, we can actually trace the time-dependent membrane fluctuations for red blood cells. And because we can trace these membrane fluctuations, we can characterize the stiffness properties of the cell. And using these stiffness properties changes, we can characterize sick red blood cells. For example, in this paper, I, I've shown that we can use this technique in order to characterize sickle cell anemia, in which the red blood cells are stiffer or fluctuate less than healthy cells. And again, I'm using, if I'm using off-axis holography, I'm using a single shot in order to acquire the entire field of view. And then, therefore, I can trace very fast optical thickness, or in this case, physical thickness, vibrations. Again, another example, imaging a neuron without any fluorescent dyes. So you can see here the neurons and the dendrites and the axon even, and using digital coloring without external contrast agent, it looks like very nice image. Here you can see a movie of a contracting cardiomyocyte, so you can trace actually the contraction of the cardiomyocyte. More information is in this paper, and therefore you can actually learn about different differences in different conditions uh, under which cardiomyocyte, which are the cells that compose our heart, are beating or contracting.